a good welcome once again to uh number five in our presentation that is um the dress reform and uh, i'm glad we can uh, join in and uh, learn together the word of god this presentation we are going to look at um, something important that is uh, dress and health dress and health so shall we bow for a word of prayer father we thank you because uh, all the good gifts come from you through your son and there is no greater blessing you will want to withhold from us that which you can withhold from your son you have given unto us the great sacrifice you have made for us lord help us to appreciate it and uh, induce others to appreciate it too in jesus name amen and so we have been going through this series of um, dress reform. And uh, as I have always said that um, we do not have to hammer these things in the ears of the people. There are better things to talk about. And E.G. White made an apology that she could talk on dress reform. But why did she make an apology? Because there's not one in a thousand of professed women who dresses according to their faith today. And so she had to speak about this. And uh, dress being an index of the heart is something so important, lest people should confuse who we are. There's uh, a woman in Proverbs chapter 7 who was dressed in uh, a garment of the harlot. And so our dress can make people confuse us what uh, to what we are not. And so... Um, Dress and health without going into much pre preliminaries. Is there any issues of health related to uh, our dress code? Is there any health issues related to our dress code? And so I'll, I'll start with the statement of E.G. White in Child Guidance, page 428, paragraph 3. There is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. There is something richer to talk of, talk of Christ, and when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. Amen. It is not your dress that makes you of value in the Lord's sight. It is the inward adorning, the graces of the Spirit, the kind word, the thoughtful consideration for others that God values. And so I, I wanted to make sure that I get that statement because people may be asking, where did you get this statement that E.G. White says that let us not talk about dress, let us not hammer it in the ears of the people? And there you have it on the screen again in uh, Child Guidance 428.3. Talk about Christ. There's no need to make the dress question the main point of uh, your religion. So dress and health. What did she have to say about um, dress and health? What did she have to say about dress and health? In uh, Selected Messages, Book 2, 466, Paragraph 3, the dress of the infant should be so arranged that it is body will not be the least compressed after taking a full meal. Dressing infants in a fashionable manner to be introduced into company for visitors to admire is very injurious to them. Their clothing is ingeniously arranged to make the child miserably uncomfortable and uh, it is frequently made still more uneasy by passing from one to another, being fondled by all. But there is an evil greater than those already named. The infant is exposed to a vitiated air or a vitiated air caused by many breaths, some of which are very offensive and injurious to the strong lungs of uh, older people. The infant lungs suffer and become diseased by inhaling the atmosphere of a room poisoned by the tobacco use sustained tended breath. Many infants are poisoned beyond remedy by sleeping in beds with their tobacco using fathers. By inhaling the poisonous tobacco effluvia, which is thrown from the lungs and pores of the skin, the system of the infant is filled with the poison. While it acts upon some as a slow poison and affects the brain, heart, liver, and lungs, and they waste away and fade gradually. Upon others, it has a more direct influence, causing spasms, fits, paralysis, palsy, and sudden death. 
The bereaved parents mourn the loss of their loved ones and wonder at the mysterious providence of God, which has so cruelly afflicted them. When providence designed not the death of these infants, they died martyrs to the filthy lust of tobacco. Their parents ignorantly, but nonetheless surely, killed their infant children by the disgusting poison. Every exhalation of the lungs of the tobacco slave poisons the air about him. Infants should be kept free from everything which will have an influence to exert the nervous system and should, whether waking or sleeping, day and night, breathe a pure, clean, healthy atmosphere free from every taint of uh, poison. We, we, we cannot escape these things. And so any injurious things placed before the child, perfumes, uh, tobacco, and all this stuff causes lung problem, brain problem, and heart problems, which sometimes acts as a slow death, but sometimes it acts as an instant uh, death. And we have heard this uh, statement by people many times that uh, uh, this is what God planned for this person. When a person dies, we hear this is what God planned. The will of God has prevailed. No, there is nothing like the will of God prevailing. We are told that the parent has killed the child and they wonder about the providence so far. God in letting this little one uh, 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 rest or uh, uh, die. No, this was not the will of God. It is carelessness on what is set before the children that kill them off. Any perfumes that will hinder the right circulation of blood or will interfere with the lungs, the heart, and all that stuff will really render an infant immobile, uh, some quickly, some, uh, some uh, slowly. And so this is a death and life issue, and uh, we shouldn't be joking around with these things. In... Uh, Selected Messages, book two, page 467, another great cause of um, mortality among infants and youth is the custom of leaving their arms and shoulders naked. This fashion cannot be severely censored. It has caused the life of thousands. The air bathing the arms and limbs and circulating above the, about the armpits chills these sensitive portions of the body so near the vitals and hinders the healthy circulation of the blood and induces disease, especially of the lungs and brain. Those who regard the health of their children of more value than uh, the foolish flutter of visitors or the admiration of strangers will ever clothe the shoulders and arms of their tender infants. The mother's attention has been frequently called to the purple arms and hands of her child, and she has been cautioned in regard to this health and the love-destroying practice. And the answer has often been, I always dress my children in this manner. They get used to it. I cannot endure to see the arms of infants covered. It looks old-fashioned. These mothers dress their delicate infants as they will not venture to dress themselves. They know that if their own arms were exposed without a covering, they will shiver with chilliness. Can infants of a tender age endure this process of hardening without receiving injury? Some children may have at birth so strong constitution that they can endure such abuse without it is costing them life. Yet thousands are sacrificed and tens of thousands have the foundation laid for a short, invalid life by the custom of bandaging and uh, suffating the body with much clothing while the arms which are at such distance from the seat of life and for that cause need even more clothing than the chest and lungs are left naked. Can mothers expect to have quiet and healthy infants who thus treat uh, them. No, the answer is no. Perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Special attention should be given to the extremities that uh, they may be as thoroughly clothed as the chest and the regions over the heart. Where is the greatest amount of heat? Parents who dress their children with the extremities naked or nearly so are sacrificing the health and lives of their children to fashion. If these parts are not so warm as the body, the circulation is not equalized. When the extremities, which are remote from the vital organs, are not properly clad, the blood is driven to the head, causing headache or nosebleed, or there is a sense of fullness about the chest, producing a cough or palpitation of the heart, an account on account of too much blood in that locality or the stomach has too much blood 
Posing in Digestion, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 531, paragraph 2. In, uh, uh, in the Councils on Health, page 92.3, we read, Another evil which custom fosters is the unequal distribution of the clothing, so that while some parts of the body have more than is required, others are insufficiently clad. The feet and limbs being remote from the vital organs should be especially guarded from cold by abundant clothing. It is impossible to have health when the extremities are habitually cold, for if there is too little blood in them, there will be too much in other portions of the body. Perfect health requires a perfect circulation, but this cannot be had while three or four times as much clothing is worn upon the body where the vital organs are situated as upon the feet and limbs. In uh, Ministry of Healing, page 282, paragraph 3, we are looking at, um, is there e any effects of health on the way we dress? And so dress and health. In all respects, the dress should be healthful. Above all things, God desires to be as to be in health, health of body and soul. And we are to be workers together with him for the health of both soul and body. Both are promoted by healthful dress. So the physical and uh, the, the physical body and the soul uh, are really, uh, their health is really promoted by the dress that uh, we put on. And uh, we shall see that in a short while. In uh, Councils on Health, 93, paragraph 3, women who are in failing health can do much for themselves by sensible dressing and exercise. When suitable, Suitably dressed for outdoor enjoyment, let them exercise in the open air, carefully at first, but increasing the amount of exercise as they can endure it. By taking this course, many might regain health and live to take their share in the world's work. Amen. Um, the Health Reformer, August 1, 1868, paragraph 16, Effect of Exposed Extremity. The limbs and feet have large veins to receive a large amount of blood that warmth, nutrition, elasticity, and strength may be imparted to them. But when the blood is chilled from these extremities, their blood vessels contract, which makes the circulation of the necessary amount of blood in them still more difficult. A good circulation preserves the blood pure and secures health. A bad circulation leaves the blood to become impure and induces congestion of the brain and lungs and causes diseases of the head, the heart, the liver, and the lungs. The fashionable style of women's dress is one of the greatest causes of all these terrible diseases. In uh, 1868, paragraph 17, Health Reform, August 1, we continue. But the evil does not stop here. These fashionable mothers transmit their diseases to their feeble offspring, and they clothe their feeble little girls as unhealthful as they clothe themselves and soon bring them to the condition of invalids, or which is preferably in many cases to the grave. Thus, fashion fills our cemeteries with many short graves and the houses of the slaves of fashion with invalids. Oh God, must this state of things continue? You can answer that, but on my side, I say no. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 634, paragraph 4. Saturn is constantly devising some new style of dress that shall prove an injury to physical and moral health, and he exults when he sees professed Christians eagerly accepting the fashion that he has invented. The amount of physical suffering created by unnatural and unhealthful dress cannot be estimated. Many have become lifelong invalids through their compliance with the demands of fashion. Displacements and deformities, cancers, and other terrible diseases are among the evils resulting from fashionable dress. I'm just reading through the testimonies. I'm reading through the writing so that um, we may not add a word or remove a word, but again, we shall come to the history and then the scientific view of it. But it's good to start from um, uh, inspiration and see where it leads us. Is our dress connected in any way to our health? This is number five in the series, The Dress Reform. And we are looking at 
uh, the issue of grace and health. Mind, character, and personality, volume one, page 289, paragraph two. Grace is an index of the mind and heart. That which is hung upon the outside is the sign of what is within. It does not require intellect or a cultivated mind to overdress. The very fact that women can hang upon their person such an amount of needless articles of clothing shows that they cannot have time to cultivate their intellects and store their minds with useful knowledge. Again, certain inventions. And uh, now we, we want to see how these are certain inventions. You say, what, what, what? How, how is this uh, certain invention? How are these beautiful women, in quotes, an invention of certain? Just look at them and then let us go to inspiration, what it says. It's one way to take another person's beauty for yourself. And uh, 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 allow me share something, by the way. Um, you heard. Uh, we talk about um, Saturn's invention. I want us to listen to this very well and uh, just uh, hear what this person is saying about these fashionable heads and all they are looking like. It's one way to take another person's beauty for yourself. See this woman's hair? It's real, just not really hers. You can have long hair now, one day. Our crowning glory is more bejeweled than ever. Some of the world's most alluring women share one trait, long, thick, beautiful hair. A few admit to adding a little something extra. Most don't. But today's style icons are sending a very clear message. Hair is in. This dish is very good. In 2006, more than 79,000 tons of human hair was imported just in the U.S. Black gold in bundles. I charge 2,000 to short, 3,000 to shoulder, 4,000 pairs. The market is growing, an estimated 5 to 10 percent a year, thanks in part to an increased demand for extensions. It's like exponential. So you might be surprised to learn that this vanity is actually being fed by those seeking humility. <laughs> The Venkateshwara Temple in southern India is one of Hinduism's holiest sites. Some 50,000 devotees visit each day, according to temple officials. That's more than the Vatican and Mecca. Subayama has come with her entire family. Lord Venkateshwar is our favorite god. Like so many worshippers, she brought the god a very special offering. Her hair. We feel happy if we shave our heads and very peaceful. All of our problems will vanish. It's part of a ritual called tonsuring, the cutting of hair for religious reasons. Every day, thousands of Hindus sit before the temple barbers and a straight razor to offer their hair and please the god. For the temple, this has created a divine business model as a hot commodity is donated by the tons. So they sell it to companies that process much of it for hair extensions. It's an $18 million a year business. Temple officials say the profits are then used to bless others by funding charity programs. By and large, the devotees don't know any of this. And when we showed them what happens to the hair, they didn't really care. We completed our vow to the God, and we are just happy about it. We don't think of anything other than this. But after the hair leaves their head, it starts the journey to someone else's. The hair purchased from the temple is what is brought in here. Benjamin Sherian has built his empire a strand at a time, one he now shares with his son. So there's about 11 tons of hair in the Yeah, easily. The Sherian's business is just one link in a long chain from the temple to the salon, and each step adds to the final price tag. If it is sold to the wholesaler, and if the wholesaler sells it to the retailer, he'll have a markup depending upon maybe 50 to 100 percent. One reason Indian hair is so valuable is because it comes in a variety of textures, from straight to wavy to curly. There's a type to match every demand. While temple hair is considered some of the best, it is not the most abundant. Only about a quarter of all Indian hair is from tonsure halls. The rest comes not by a barber's blade, but the teeth of a comb. We comb our hair two or three times a day. In the village of Sri Kalahasti, about 30 miles from the temple, not a strand of hair goes to waste. Whatever comes out in the comb is collected and sold, albeit for much less than temple hair. 
dead hair, as it's often called, is considered worse quality. They buy it very cheap from us. This is the hair of 60 women gathered in one day. They'll sell it for about $2.50. At the temple, devotees don't get any money for their hair, but hope to be repaid with blessings. A world away, their offering is happily accepted. Beauty sacrificed by one to be taken up by another. Mara Schiavocampo, NBC News, Tirupati, India. Now, uh, I want you to get this because uh, that is how interesting it is. These women of uh, India, they sacrifice their hair to the goddess to get a blessing and then they get they don't get anything any money from it apart from the blessings they're expecting from their goddess or their god their idol and then people collect it and then it is called the black gold it is taken to the western it is uh, taken to the industries and then it is uh, arranged well and then sold to retailers and wholesalers and people put it on their on their heads, things sacrificed unto idols. This is what people are wearing. This is Satan's invention. And so the commentator says that uh, uh, this vanity is uh, also uh, uh, put on people who profess humility. You, you can think about that. The Christians who actually are professing humility can afford to put things sacrificed to idols on their heads. And they think that it is fashionable, by the way. May, may the Lord save us from these things. It is uh, something uh, amazing. Again, there's something again to think about. Hello and welcome to Witness, the best documentaries from around the world. Stories told from a personal perspective. I'm Rida Fahri. Perhaps you won't be surprised to hear that globalization means that women all over the world now aspire to much the same set of beauty standards. Things like the long, luxuriant hair that many women wear in the form of hair extensions. But have you ever thought about where all that perfect hair comes from? Filmmakers Raffaele Brunetti and Marco Leopardi wanted to find out, and their revealing film answers this question by telling the story of two women in India and a man in Rome who between them reflect the realities behind the demands of today's modern beauty standards, Hair India. In order to pay for his wedding to the goddess, All the bad energy we Vishnu had here. to take out a huge debt with Kubera, the treasurer of the gods. Kubera demanded a very high interest rate and decided that the debt would be extinguished over thousands of years. Down the centuries, generations of devotees have continued to pay off the debt with money and jewels. Children are even forced into the giving their hair. Little children are shaved without their consent to get this hair dedicated to their their gods and then their, their soul in the western and other parts where Africans import these things and they put their heads. And as you have just seen, uh, bad all the bad energy will be in their hair. Why even the bad energy? Because these things are done to their children without their consent. Some are crying for losing their hair and all this stuff. And yet they are told that it's a blessing. And so you can get these clips online and uh, you can watch them Al Jazeera where the hair that you wear comes from and uh, uh, why were the hair themselves given in the first step. It's amazing. Seventh day Adventists can listen to such a things and they still just walk in the shop and buy those things and put on their, their heads. It's uh, a curse and um, it is irrational completely to have such information and then you play ignorant to these things otherwise now look at what sister white talks about this hair that these people put on their heads 
And by the way, no wonder people have used these artificial hairs and they have become mad. You wonder what is happening. It is because, as the commentators say, all bad energy will be in this air. And so that is what they believe. You may say that I don't believe in, in the bad energy, but these things have been sacrificed to the idols and uh, 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 we are taking them. We shall see about uh, things sacrificed to the idol, what we are told. But uh, these artificial things that people put on the hair, we are looking at uh, dress and health. Is there any connection between dress and uh, health? Fashion loads the heads of women with artificial braids and pads, which do not add to their beauty, but give an unnatural shape to the head. The hair is strained and forced into unnatural positions, and it is not possible for the heads of these fashionable ladies to be comfortable. The artificial hair and pads covering the base of the brain heat and brain heat and excite the spinal nerves centering in the brain. The head should ever be kept cool. The heat caused by this artificial induced artificials induces the blood to the brain. The action of the blood upon the lower or animal organs of the brain causes unnatural activity, tends to recklessness in morals, and the mind and heart is in danger of being corrupted. As the animal organs are excited and strengthened, the moral are enfeebled. The moral and intellectual powers of the mind become servants to the animal. Uh, the Health Reformer, October 1, 1871, paragraph 9. Again, in consequence of the brain being congested, it is nerves lose their healthy action and take on morbid conditions, making it almost impossible to arouse the moral sensibilities. Such a lose, such a lose their power to design sacred things. The unnatural heat caused by these artificial deformities about the head induces the blood to the brain, producing congestion and causing the natural hair to fall off producing baldness. Thus, the natural is sacrificed for that fissure. Health Reform, October 1, 1871, paragraph 10. Again, in paragraph 11, many have lost their reason. They have become just mad and become hopelessly insane by following this deforming fashion. Yet the slaves to the fashion will continue to thus dress their heads and suffer horrible disease and premature death rather than be out of fashion. No wonder... No wonder we are told simply like this. I want us to repeat this statement, not to hammer it upon the people, but um, just to make sure that we are understanding what uh, we are reading. We are told fashion, fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedient to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other uh, power to separate our people from God. I have been shown that our church rules are very deficient. All exhibitions of pride in dress, which is forbidden in the word of God, should be sufficient reason for church uh, discipline. If there is a continuing in face of warnings and appeals and entreaties to still follow the perverse will, it may be regarded as a proof that the heart is no way assimilated to Christ. Self and only self is the object of adoration, and one such a professed Christian will lead many away from God. What should the reformers do? There is a terrible sin upon us as a people that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with their faith. We must arise at once and close the door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will become demoralized. They will not become demoralized. Our churches are demoralized as we speak right now. And so these things calls for a censure and a punishment. Now let us look at the history of braiding and plating. Where did it come from, by the way? The history of braiding. In Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia we read, a braid, also referred to as a plate, is a complex structure or pattern formed by interlacing three or more strands of flexible material such as textile fibers, wire, or hair. Compared to the process of weaving, which usually involves two separate perpendicular groups of strands warp and weft, a braid is usually long and narrow, with each component strand functionally equivalent in zigzagging forward through the overlapping mass of the others. The most simple braid is a flat, solid, three-strand structure. More complex braid can be constructed from an arbitrary number of strands to create wider range of uh, structures. In some regions, a braid was a means of communication. 
at a glance one individual could distinguish a wealth of information about another whether they were married morning or of age for courtship simply by observing their hairstyle very interesting that by just looking at the hairstyle of somebody you could know if they were mourning if uh, they were uh, married or if they were at the age of courtship certain higher styles were distinctive to particular tribes or nations other styles informed others of an individual status in the society Braiding is traditionally a social art. Because of the time it takes to braid hair, people took time to socialize while braiding and having their hair done. It begins with the elders making simple notes and braids for younger children. Older children watch and learn from them. Smart practicing on younger children and eventually uh, learn the traditional designs. In the U.S., you see mothers and grandmothers braiding and putting colorful beards, beads in little children's hair. This carries on a tradition of bonding between elders and the new generation. Now, these are different types of braid that um, were done anciently. And so we have the braid in 1887 by Auguste Renault, the Venus of Willentroff with braided hair or wearing woven basket, the Venus of Brassenboy with a hairstyle or a geometrically decorated um, hood. And um, we have these, these different things. Now, um, a hair braiding is an ancient art dating back to almost uh, 3500 BC. It is believed that this ancient uh, hairstyle originated in ancient Egypt and West Africa. Another sample from different origin was uh, traced back to a burial site called Saqqara, located on the Nile River, during the first dynasty of Pharaoh Menes. It has been a large part of many cultures all around the world. In Africa, hair braiding was a social event among women. Young girls began by having their female relatives braid their hair and then in turn practiced on their friends and relatives until they learned the many elaborate styles of African braiding. Fishtail braid. Fishtail goat is named for creating a braid that looks like the tail of a fish. A fishtail resembles a fringe braid in. It is smoothly woven appearance but divides the hair into only two sections instead of three. The style was called the Grecian braid in the 19th century. It assumed to be called this because some Greek goddess hair resembled it. Now you start getting at the gist of the matter. Corn rose. Corn rose are said to have originated in Africa and have the longest history there, but have also been featured in art from ancient Greece as well as a Celtic woman. In Yoruba art, the rose symbolizes civilization, order, and agriculture. A woman with fine complex corn rose was seen to be well cared for and from a strong family. In the U.S., they were worn exclusively by Gavists and those in the back to Africa movements until the Black is Beautiful trend in 60s and 17. The trend was refreshed in the late 90s and took off worldwide in 2000 when they became a more often style on Paris runaways. And uh, if you look closely at these things and um, their meaning, their origin, it is all pagan. It is all uh, 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 in uh, honor of uh, goddess or some god or some idol in their society, in their society. This, we should never do something that we are ignorant of. Effects of uh, high heel. Another issue, effects of the high heel. And so you can see the blood is not well circulated to the body parts and then we have complex diseases and bent bones. Thousands are becoming invalids. Thousands are becoming lame. Thousands are becoming uh, 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 sick and sickly because of these things. So what are the effects of high heels? Um, uh, and uh, you know what? Your feet has a mouth, it cries, but because you are people in nature you are a little horn in nature you can't hear the voice and i said that uh, we are in danger of becoming people in every way in that uh, in daniel chapter 7 the, uh, the the little horn has um, the head and it has the mouth and it have the eyes but what it's missing is the ears and um, coincidentally um and interestingly the letters to the seven churches ends by saying, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit speaketh to the churches. 
Now, if you are papal in nature, if you are a little horn in nature, then it means that these letters will have no effect on you because you don't have ears. And so your feet has a mouth and it, um, uh, 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 it expects you to have ears, but many people have closed their ears and they have become purple in nature. Effects of the high heels, imbalance the feet, all 26 bones, 33 joints, and 100 plus muscles, ligaments, and tendons help support the body and keep you balanced. But um, you, you can see that with high heels, you will never keep balance because the, the bones are strained, the muscles are strained, the veins are not working. And you, you see on the left, uh, nearly down, actually, how the toes are now looking. The dangers of high heels, poor posture, chronic foot pain, tears and tears and fractures, pain in heel and eggs, pain in the knees and hips because blood is not induced properly in these areas and so it starts causing deformities. In 1 Corinthians, looking at all these things, it says um, we cannot... By, by the way, talking about that hair that is sacrificed to idol, uh, we cannot partake of the cup of the Lord and partake of the cup of the devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of the devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 1 Corinthians 10, 21 to 24. 23 says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And so uh, these things, when you look at them, actually, um, they don't tend to, uh, uh, they don't tend to edifying. They don't tend to um, uh, bringing in spirituality but um, they are uh, tending to death and nothing else. They are tending to death and nothing else. And so let us be careful. Whatever that we are doing, let us be sure that um, we are uh, actually doing the will of God and not um, the will of man, the will of God and not um, the will of man. And so, Continued on, we cannot partake of the table um, of uh, the Lord and also partake the table of the, uh, of the devils. And so with all these side effects, we are told, look at the tight-fitting waist of the dress of these children. It is impossible for their lungs to have full action. The heart and liver cannot do their work, thus compressed. Look at their limbs, unclad except by the slight covering of cotton stockings. The air chills the limbs, the life current is driven back from its natural course, and the limbs are robbed of their proportion of blood. The blood which should be induced to the extremities by their being properly clad is thrown back upon the internal organs. There is too much blood in the head. The lungs are congested or the liver is burdened by interrupting the circulation of blood and the entire system is drained. Even the day of the service of worship uh, are not exempt from fashion's dom do domination. Rather, they afford opportunity for the greater display of her power. The church is made a parade ground and fashions are studied more than the sermon. The poor, unable to meet the demands of custom, stay away from the church altogether. The day of rest is spent in idleness and by the youth often is associated that as often in association that are demoralizing education to 47.4. Again, in the professed Christian world, enough is expended for jewels and needlessly expensive dress to feed all the hungry and to clothe the naked. Fashion and display absorb the means that might comfort the poor and the suffering. All matters of dress should be strictly done what guarded following closely the Bible rule. Fashion has been the goddess who have ruled the outside world and she often insinuates herself into the church. The church should make the word of God her standard and parents should think intelligently upon this subject. Some will enter the place of worship with their hearts on in soil that clothes. Such do not realize that they are to meet with God and holy angels. There should be a radical change in this matter all through our churches. 
ministers themselves need to elevate their ideas to have finer sustainability susceptibilities in regard to it. It is a feature of the work that has been sadly neglected. Because of the irreverence in attitude, dress and deportment, and lack of a worshipful frame of mind, God has often turned his face away from those assembled for his worship. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 498, paragraph 3. Again, in uh, Manuscript Releases, Volume 3, 234.4. In entering the house of worship, you should remember that it is the house of God. Respect should be shown by the removal of the heart, remembering that you are entering into the presence of God and angels. You should teach the children reverence. Let earnest effort be carried forward to this end and remember that you are the temple of the living God. So we are moving from the physical diseases to moral diseases. Any vanity in clothing or dress either will cause physical harm or moral, moral degradation. Souls lost because of carelessness. Evangelism, page 671, paragraph 2. A minister who is negligent in his apparel often wounds those of good taste and refined sensibilities. Those who are faulty in this respect should correct their errors and be more circumspect. The laws of some souls at last will be traced to the untidiness of the minister. The first appearance affected the people unfavorably because they could not in any way link his appearance with the, the with the sorry. The first appearance affected the people unfavorably because they could not in any way link his appearance with the truth he presented. His dress was against him, and the impression given was that the people whom he represented were a careless set who cared nothing about their dress. And his hearers did not want anything to do with such a class of people. You wonder why churches are decreasing with people. Maybe it is because of these people who do not dress well. Second Testimonies, uh, Testimonies Volume 2, page um, 613, paragraph 2. Here, according to the light that has been given me, there has been a manifest neglect among our people. Ministers sometimes stand in the desk with their hair in disorder, looking as if it had been untouched by comb and brush for a week. God is dishonored when they, those who engage in, this, in his sacred service are so neglectful of their appearance. Anciently, the priests were required to have their garments in a particular style to do service in the holy place and minister in the priest's office. They were to have garments in accordance with their work, and God distinctly specified what this should be. The lava was placed between the altar and the congregation that before they came into the presence of God, in the sight of the congregation, they might wash their hands and their feet. What impression was this to make upon the people? It was to show them that they that every particle of dust must be put away before they could go into the presence of God. For he was so high and holy that unless they did comply with these conditions, death will fall. Having many died, both physical and spiritual, because of these things. What about cosmetics? Many. This is um, um, uh, HL, health reformer, and uh, this is health for the daily living. Uh, I'll just go to it. Healthful living, and um, this is um, page uh, 189, paragraph 2. Many are ignorantly injuring their health and endangering their life by using cosmetics. When they become heated, the poison is absorbed by the pores of the skin and it is thrown into the blood. Many lives have been sacrificed by this means alone. Ladies may resort to cosmetics to restore the tint of the complexion, but they cannot thus bring back to glow of health, healthful feelings to the heart. That which darkens and makes dingy the skin also clouds the spirit and destroys cheerfulness and peace of mind. And so many are, um, uh, many people are thinking that as they do this to look young, uh, that um, their health is improved in any way. But uh, the health of these people is not being improved, but uh, it is being uh, sacrificed daily. It is being sacrificed daily. And uh, I want to 
believe that uh, at the end of uh, these sessions that we shall think about the things that uh, we are doing. We shall think to whose glory uh, are we doing these things? To whose glory are we doing what um, we are doing? This aspect of uh, trying to look younger, by the way, we should leave it with, with God. If we want to look young, then uh, let us be uh, in the Lord and then we shall be as young as we want to be because uh, when Christ is enshrined in the heart, when Christ is enshrined in the heart, we shall always have this glow that um, uh shall never fade away but uh, these temporary things that we put on ourselves really when uh, the skin rejects them we will have sacrificed uh, our physical life and not only physical life but um, eternal life but also eternal life continued on uh, we read uh, we, we see we have different cosmetics that people use. And uh, uh, in uh, Health Reform, October 1, 1897, we read, many are ignorantly injuring their health and endangering their life by using cosmetics. They are robbing the cheeks of the glow of health. And then to supply the deficiency, they use cosmetics. When they become heated in the dance, the poison is absorbed by the pores of the skin and is thrown in the blood. Many lives have been sacrificed by this means alone and so uh people are um, applying these things and um, when they have applied these things they think that um, sometimes they look young but actually they at last don't look young but uh, they just look uh, terrible they look terrible and so we are told that um, Many are sacrificing their health at the shrine of uh, uh, looking younger and uh, such uh, like uh, things. Continued on, again we read, the majority of pleasure lovers attend the fashionable night gatherings and spend in exciting amusement the hours God has given them for quiet, for quiet rest and sleep in order to invigorate the body. They are robbing the cheeks of the glow of health and then to supply the deficiencies use cosmetics. So when you spend your time in much call, in pleasure attending, uh, spending the night, turning the night into days, you rob the cheeks of... Um, uh, what you rob the cheeks of the glow of health and then when they see they are in this condition they are uh, they, they they want to supply the deficient with the cosmetics um and so we are told that um in uh, in uh, we are told in my life today that uh, this habit of turning days nights into day actually robs the cheek of the glow of health would it not be better uh be therefore to break up this habit of turning night into day and the fresh hours of morning into night if the youth will form habits of regularity and order they will improve in health in spirit in memory and disposition and so we hope that um we will have a balanced mind about these things a balanced mind about these things and then when we receive the information let us ask ourselves what are we going to do with this information what are we going to do with this information because many times uh, people receive the information they feel sorry not for the sin and uh, destroying the temple of god but um, they feel sorry of just the consequences. They are not um, uh, feeling sorry because um, this is sin 
and Jesus Christ is hurt by it. They don't feel sorry because Jesus Christ is hurt. The one who gave us this body wants us to maintain it in order. And if we don't maintain it in order, we crucify the Son of God once again. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26, we are told that um, if we sin uh, willfully after knowing the truth, there remains no uh, sacrifice for uh, our sin. There remains no sacrifice for our sin. Placenda. Let us look at this issue of placenda as we try to wrap this down. How are placenta creams manufactured and sourced? Placenta creams are usually sourced from high quality animal sources such as sheep that have successfully given birth, shares lancer. The discarded placenta is harvested, purified, and processed into skin compatible protect. Is there a scientific evidence that placenta skin care works? Not really, and that is due to a lack of scientific research and testing. There is empiric evidence and clinical photographic data indicating a significant benefit from placenta cream if the product is properly created, Lancer says. That is a general way of saying that the high quality is the better way to go or if you are looking into placenta skin care. Studies showed positive effects toward wound and burn treatment with placenta creams, including the rate of uh, epithelialization or the beginning of the wound healing phase seeing a significant uh, increase. Are there dangers to using placenta skin care? The lack of testing on placenta skin care should be enough to give anyone pause. With King having concern about the hormones present in placenta possibly being the cause of some problems in potential users, Lanza says to keep an eye on that ingredient list. Poorly manufactured cosmetic products can lead to unwanted irritation, inflammation, and lack of efficacy results. The key is to find a proper high-quality product. But really, if you are hesitant, King doesn't blame you. The lack of scientific evidence is also a reason to not prioritize this kind of cream when there are so many better studied options. Now, David Bang, a dermatologist in New York, says he worries the creams might do harm. There is a small amount of research that claims placental products moisturize and tighten skin. But there is also evidence that claims the estrogen present in placenta may cause problems, says Bang. And so... Parabens, what are parabens? Parabens are synthetic chemicals that are used as uh, preservatives in personal care products, foods, beverages, and pharmaceuticals. As preservatives, parabens increase a product's shelf life by preventing harmful bacteria, fungus, and yeast from growing. While there has been more buzz about parabens the past few years, these sneaky culprits have actually been around since the 1950s. Parabens are no strangers to the cosmetics and skincare industries. According to the American Chemical Society, most parabens are in 85% of health, beauty, and personal care products. They are commonly listed under methyl, ethyl, propyl, uh, ispropyl, and batyl, or isobatyl parabens. And so when uh, we are talking about uh, methyl, uh, this is very dangerous uh, composition. While it seems these little superheroes may be saving the life of your product, Turns out they could be moonlighting as your skins and bodies are nemesis. Look at uh, the five side effects that make parabens unsafe. As the adage goes, too much of something can be bad for you, and parabens are no exception. With the majority of parabens being found in conventional beauty products, daily use of these products over time can cause a buildup of parabens and do more harm than good. This occurs when these products and their pesky parabens are absorbed through the skin into the body. Just like uh, makeup and skincare products, food and beverages also need preservatives to prevent harmful bacteria and microbes from growing and harming us. When parabens are ingested over time through food or food addictives, the health risk and effects can be potentially worse. Follow, al follow along to find out the risk and facts about these stranger dangers and why you should avoid them. One, there are endocrine disruptors. The chemical structure of paraben is similar to the hormone estrogen. Research shows this estrogen mimicking has marked them as endocrine disruptors, and parabens have 
even been recently linked to cases of early puberty in girls. Now, you wonder why these young girls are getting puberty and pregnant at early stage. These are the chemicals they are using over time. Endocrine disruption can lead to a variety of problems, including adult onset acne, male breast growth, development, developmental and neurological disorders, and various cancers. Other studies have shown that parabens can also alter thyroid hormone levels, causing possible adverse health effects. Links to breast cancer. Number two, while some research has revealed that parabens can mimic the activity of the hormone estrogen in the body's cells, this estrogenic activity is associated with certain forms of breast cancer. Estrogen is a female hormone that has been linked to cause both normal and cancerous breast cells to grow and divide. Parabens have also been found present in breast tumors. In 2004, British scientist Philippa Dabry published a research paper that appeared to find traces of parabens in breast cancer tissue samples. This study, testing for parabens in human breast cancer tumors, found traces of five different parabens in 19 of 20 tumors. Dabry found that not only can parabens enter your body through the skin, they fuel the growth of existing cancer cells. There has been research into parabens. Number three, links to reproductive problems. There has been a research into parabens being linked to an increased risk of uh, reproductive problems. These changes may contribute to adverse health effects in both mothers and their children, potentially leading to reproductive complications and heightened risk of cancer in the adults, as well as developmental issues in children can, can cause allergic reaction. Parabens can trigger irritation and allergic reactions in the skin, especially to sensitive damage or broken skin. Studies show that parabens can be especially inflammatory to those with pre-existing conditions of uh, psoriasis, enzema, or a pattern of contact uh, dermatitis. This is why parabens are not often used to preserve topical hydrocortisone creams or antibiotic ointments. Number five, absor absorbed quickly by skin. Just how quickly and easily can parabens get absorbed in the skin? According to EWG, parabens are absorbed rapidly through intact and broken skin. In 2006, the Centers for Disease Control detected parabens in nearly all of the 100 urine samples tested indicating widespread exposure in Americans. This proved that these widely used chemicals get absorbed quickly and easily into the skin, which over time could cause harm. Now, one wise person says, whatever you cannot put on your mouth to eat, don't put it on your skin. The concern with this chemical is that scientific studies suggest that parabens can disrupt hormones in the body and harm fertility and reproductive, reproductive organs affect birth outcomes and increase the risk of cancer, they can also cause skin irritation. Now, to those who consistently adopted the reformed breast, appreciating its advantages and cheerfully taking their position in opposition to pride and fashion, it proved a blessing. We can have a blessed life or we can have a cursed life. Those who do well their dress reform, we are told it will prove a blessing. When properly made, it was a becoming and consistent dress and recommended itself to persons of candid mind, even among those not of our faith. So our dress can attract those of our faith and not of our faith, and it can prove to be a blessing. But what is the problem? Nothing but the grace of God can convict and convert the heart. He alone can the slaves of custom obtain power to break the shackles which bind them. So you won't go outside there and say, okay, I have had the information. I'm going to burn everything and put on at long dresses and not braid my hair and do all these uh, stupid stuffs. No, only the grace of God. If you go there and do it without the grace of God, if you are not converted, it doesn't matter how much you'll try. Back to our, uh, um, our statement, here is where we started and here is where we're closing in this uh, presentation. There is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. There is something richer to talk of, talk of Christ. And when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. It is not your dress that makes you of value in the Lord's sight. It is the inward adorning, the graces of the spirit, the kind word, the thoughtful consideration for others that uh, God values. And so the problem we are facing is a problem of the heart condition. 
we have a disease called heart failure because Christ is not there. But when Christ comes there and restores the heart and it starts operating well, then all these shackles that we are talking of will fall off. So let us preach Christ. And when people accept Christ, all this will follow. But then we have to apologize that we have to touch the grace reform because not one in a thousand women who profess this faith, more so Seventh-day Adventism faith, do not dress the way they should dress. And so uh, they could have been uh, living episodes, but now because they are not, we are forced to enter into the question of the dress. Otherwise, um, the graves that we are seeing, the small cemeteries that we are seeing, many of them, one we are told they died because of poor eating, and the second thing, they died of poor dressing. And then the third thing is natural causes. So food is killing so much people and then dress following so closely. You may think that malaria is a killer disease. Yes, it is and kills millions, but we are told food and dressing have uh, 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 obtained or have taken the lives of many than any disease that you can think of. Many are born invalids, many grow up uh, mad, and we wonder at these things, but the issue is that um, uh, people have not given their hearts to Christ. Their lives are shortened because of disobedience. May we be obedient and eat the fruit of our land, which is eternal life. The Lord has promised us this, and if we are obedient, we shall eat the fruit of the land. Our Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for this uh, hour. And uh, we pray that where we have gone to extremes, Lord, you may correct things by your spirit in the hearts of thy people. Otherwise, we are pray praying for your blessing. And above all, Lord, that uh, the loss of souls may not be traced to us, the ministers who stand on the pulpit, and uh, uh, our wives, our sisters, and our bro bro brothers. Help us that uh, what we wear outside shall be an index of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.